All right. Uh, last session between you and drinks. Exciting place to be, huh, guys? <laughs> I'll, t I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you uh, have tried to develop an application before? All right. And how many of you have never tried to develop an application before? All right. And how many of you wouldn't raise your hand regardless of what I said? All right. Um, so when it comes uh, to building applications, there's really two schools of thought. One is that you painstakingly plan every aspect of your project before you get started. Uh, the other one is to get started, bring your idea to life, and then get feedback from your customers and other people in your community uh, and make changes along the way. Um, and there's benefits and pitfalls to each of these, and that's what our conversation is going to be about today. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what it feels like when it's your own money on the line. Um, and uh, really what we're, what we're looking to do is uh, explore these two gentlemen's journey in building applications, and they have very different journeys, so I've always enjoyed talking to them about it. Um, so as Nikki mentioned, I'm head of sales at Builder. I've been in the applications development uh, space for about 25 years. Primarily worked in low-code and no-code application development platforms. Um, so if you want to learn about that part of the industry, I can always talk about that stuff forever. It'll put you to sleep in about 35 seconds, so it's great. Um, and uh, with me, I've got Sam, who I met at uh, Silicon Slopes last year. So uh, Sam is at uh, D2D Experts. Um, and uh, special thanks to uh, Coin for coming all the way from Florida and narrowly escaping Hurricane Ian to be here. Um, he's with uh, Sirhant, which is the, the fastest growing luxury real estate brand on the planet. It's the best um, real estate brand on the planet. Just yeah. Yeah, Sirhant. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourselves, uh, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Sam? Yeah, so I met Builder AI uh, last year here at Silicon Slopes. I'm just walking by just like a normal vendor, and all of a sudden I see that they could build this app thing and just like Legos. And he's like, look, in a matter of a minute, do you want to watch me build your app? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, do you have an app idea? And I was like, I do. And we start ideating, and we start looking at it, and now a year later, we're actually launching next month our version of the app that we build with them called Expand. And it's pretty cool. It's a human development system that is designed to help you as a leader coach and manage the people you lead through goal setting, assignment tracking, and actual like learning management community. So that's what I do. That's, that's pretty badass. Where should people go download that? Expandapp.io. Go check it. Good plug there. <laughs> I paid him for that. <laughs> No, no, we need to see you actually pay him for that. <laughs> All right, Coin. Uh, hi, uh, I call myself the technology ambassador for the people, as I am the nerdiest person that I know, but I also know how to talk to people, and I'm not scared of a microphone. I've been holding this thing for three days, just waiting to turn it on. Um, I'm the chief technology officer of a company called Sirhant. Anybody here ever watched the television show Million Dollar Listing on the Bravo Network before? My boss is Ryan Serhand, who was the star of that show for about nine seasons. I've been with him for all nine years. Um, and we do a bunch of different things, including uh, media production. We produce between 10 and 20 pieces of video content per day for all the social channels for our 5 million plus followers, in addition to creating online sales education courses for the countries, 110 countries around the world that we've sold the courses in. Uh, in addition to being the luxury real estate brokerage that is taking Manhattan uh, and the Hamptons by storm. Uh, we even just last week put the penthouse of Central Park Tower on the market for $250 million. It is the most expensive listing in the United States. Uh, and I'm in charge of all the technology decisions and making sure that nothing breaks so business dad is happy that things run good. <laughs> A steal at twice the price? Uh, yeah. I mean, I can get you like, you know, 100 bucks off if you want to do on or something. <laughs> All right, so uh, the question that we're trying to address today is how to approach building your app. Uh, so when it comes to building an app, should we focus on quicker releases in order to build momentum for your business, or should we strive for perfection and then not release until the app is 100% complete? Might take more time. Um, is it possible to achieve both? Um, and how do you decide on what's right for you? Uh, of course, we know that these aren't the only options. Uh, many of you scarred by previous attempts have given up on 
ideating on your applications and are kind of stuck with whatever uh, w whatever you have. Um, and uh, you know, we want to hear from uh, from Sam and Quinn on this. So, what do you guys think? Oh man, it can be tempting to do both of those things, right? Don't you ever wish you could kind of go down both paths and see what happened if you did it both ways, right? Uh, there's even been times in my career where I was consulting other clients before I was full time with Ryan Serhan uh, and the brokerage, um, where we actually did both. We would hire two different developers and kind of have a race, almost like how Google offers the X Prize, and a bunch of different companies compete to solve the same challenge and the same problem different ways. But not every business has that flexibility. You're making a big gamble and a big bet. It's one of the reasons that when we came across Builder and got to talking to your team, it was it was less threatening and less anxiety inducing to know that things would remain malleable and we would retain the agility that otherwise kind of got frozen in carbonite and the plan was very rigid, like no, that'll be scope creep and that's not included or the developer, what happens if they die? How are we gonna maintain this and somebody else comes along? Uh, but yeah, it's, it can be very tempting to do both. I bought a company called Vanilla about four years ago. It's a texting platform. And my logic was it was producing about $5,000 a month and I paid $100,000 for it. So I'm like, oh, that's a great return on my money. You don't think like as a visionary and entrepreneur, you're not gonna look at this thing and just leave it alone. So what do you do? The customer says, hey, I wanna have this and I wanna have this and I wanna have this. And then you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars like every month just trying to pivot, add and, pay, and, and this feature and this feature and this feature. So it's like, if you think oh, I've got to have this whole thing mapped out before launching and this whole, I'm, I'm going to have this plan and then launch. The reality is once you launch, you start putting it into market and every customer is going to say, well, does it have this integration and does it do this? And what if it did this? And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, Dev, how long would that take? Heck, I did a project with this guy, Ben, right here. And every time I got, you know, we get customers, I, we, I was a partner in this other CRM app that we did. And, and it was just so funny because he's like, yeah, in like six weeks, I could have that little thing done. And it's just him sitting there developing it. And it's like, and I have a list of a thousand other priorities. And so what's cool about like, and that's why I like this approach with Builder AI is it's like, I'm like, hey, I want milestones. Here's MVP one, here's MVP two, MVP. I have already the five versions of my app built out and we're launching the first version next month. But it took me a while to design everything out. But every time you start designing something, you see another thing that you want. And you're like, oh, can I do this? And they go, that's another feature. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then. That sounds like Alex. And then, oh, that's another feature. But the cool part is I know exactly what it would cost. And I know the timeline it would take to do that. Versus most developers, like our teams in Ukraine, for the other tech projects that we have. And it, it would just be like, yeah, that's like four weeks. And then four weeks would go by, they're like, yeah, we're still working on it. another four weeks and then another four weeks would go by and you're like, what about this? And there's no control, there's no, and then you're spending by the hour. So then you're just like, you just took 12 weeks when you told me it was four weeks and I paid you either way. And you, and you can't take other risks, like it freezes the entire yeah, business Yeah, you're like, up. well, when can I add the other things that I wanted to add? Yeah. <laughs> Everything's predicated on when this is gonna be done. Now I need 16 other aspects of the business to freeze in time. Yeah, you're like, hold on until they get that. That sounds awful. And h how does that work when uh, you know you you literally have a finite amount of money to spend on these things? Well, what's crazy is about fifty percent of your money is probably going to go fixing the bugs that they created in the first place. I don't I don't think people realize that. Anybody that's done tech, you're paying by the hour. Well, half the hours are spending times to refix things, and then it's like that's highest priority because customers are going the shit's not working, and you're like, well, put that to the top of the list. So then your other important priorities go to the bottom of the list again. And so you're like, ah, I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel. And so it's an important thing when getting into tech that everybody should bring awareness to. Yeah, and everything, that when it's everything's an emergency, nothing's an emergency, right? Everything is always the highest priority. And you can't put out all the fires at once. You just can't do it. And so do you ever get to the point where you can't innovate at all because all the budget is going just to fixing bugs? A year and a half, yes. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding you. I go, can you tell me? I talked to the lead developer. I said, can you tell me one new thing that we've added to this thing in the last year and a half? Wow. Coin? It was like so frustrating. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, there, there's an app that we've built that's still in beta uh, and being privately tested that we did not build with Builder and that we wish we had. Um, I'm going to keep what else I say a little bit limited, just to uh, just to not be disparaging of other people who are not in the room. 
but the process definitely the m v p once that arrived we put it in people's hands and all of a sudden we saw oh my goodness maybe this thing wasn't actually ready but we don't know until we get all the different like cyberpunk twenty seventy seven they released that game and it took all the players like after all this time and all this money to reveal the problems your user base will always do that was in gmail in beta until what three years ago or four years ago yeah. or something <laughs> like that so yeah um that you, you learn about these things in a hurry in a very painful way that could threaten everything you've done uh instead of you know kind of having the ability to roll with it with solid development code bases yeah um, so when you guys think about all the various software projects that you've done over um, your entire careers, how has this approach been different for you, right? This is new for you, it's novel. Um, how has it changed the way that you think about the application development process? So I like it like, it's like hiring a lawyer, right? So if you're paying by the hour and you have to email them, they charge you for the full hour. And you're just like, did I just pay $400 for the hour? Like, you know what I mean? Or something like, you, you don't want to change anything or touch anything with the lawyer, same as a developer. With this, I go to integrate Stripe. That was one of the feature sets. And so a Stripe integration could be as simple as payment gateway, done. But then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, I want the Stripe integration to do this, this, and this. Meaning I wanted to create rev schedules based on, based on ranges, based on user types, based on one time of payment. And I, I built out this whole payment thing that would have been a very intense integration. The cool part is, as I was like, ha, huh, I only paid for the Stripe integration. That's it. I didn't tell you how detailed, and it was a one-time fix thing that they gave me with a one-time fix timeline. But to a developer, I just added 40, 50, maybe 70 hours of work and development, but it didn't cost me or stress me out to be like, can it do this, 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 and this, and this? And they're like, well, technically you got the Stripe integration. I'm like, yep. And that's how I've been able to approach things. I'm like, I got the dashboard. I don't like. I don't, I'm not limited on, I, I, you didn't say I only get four dashboards, I got the dashboard feature. Therefore, I'm gonna take 100 data points and dashboard those out, and you're gonna build all those dashboards, and it's the same price. So I've been able to think bigger and not worry about like, well, how much is that gonna cost me and how much time is that gonna take to build the intricacies that I really want in my ideal app. Yeah, I think that's a really fantastic point, right? The idea is that when you think about capabilities, you're no longer restricted to the minutia of those capabilities. It's really about the meta, like what are we trying to accomplish with that Stripe integration, for example? Yes. Yeah, I think for us, it's um, you know we, the speed at which we want to move becomes possible because when I'm sitting with my fellow leaders on the leadership team uh, and we're talking about what the business's priorities are, what we want to build first, what we think is gonna help us internally or externally the best. And the question comes up about, oh, this is also a good idea. What's that going to change in terms of timeline or cost? And I can answer them while we're still in the room, as opposed to, I'll have to get back to you. It could be weeks or other people get kinda uh, a little bit shy about asking me for other questions and things that they want answers about because they're afraid it's gonna disrupt the information or the process that I'm already scoping out with them. Um, and that's enabled us to be agile in ways that we could only have dreamed of before. Our other issue that was kind of solved by it is that we don't just have a creative team. Pretty much everybody at our company, with the exception of maybe HR and finance, is creative in some which way. And that could normally be toxic in my earlier parts of my career, um, where you have too many cooks in the kitchen, too many opinions, too many different ways that people are saying, oh, and this, and this, and this would be a good idea. And it becomes an insane, like a stew with all the ingredients from your cabinet that all of a sudden tastes like terrible because you didn't combine those flavors or layer them properly, right? So for us, it was the ability to create multiple versions of the same app. Like we have, we have, we have one of the proposals we got in the beginning was we had six different versions about the six different ways that we had ideated that we were able to confidently make a decision based on playing with a full deck of cards. Uh, versus previous efforts at moving forward with different kinds of development. We just didn't have that security and certainty around the process that was like, all right, CFO, this is gonna be a great use of this or a great use of that, or hey, marketing, get ready for a campaign that's gonna be ready to grab the baton at this specific time. Uh, and now we do, which has been great. That's really great to hear. I mean, transparency is definitely one of the most critical things that we put, put into the market when we think about our product is really thinking about how can we give you uh, visibility into your project from the first time that we have a conversation all the way through to when we're hosting it and managing it for you. 
Um, so I'm glad to hear that that's making a difference in that way. Well, think of like, I've built, anybody that's built a custom house out here, like when I'm building a custom house, in your head you're like, I kind of know the price of fridges or flooring. I could go to a floor store or I could go look at what a toilet would cost. I kind of know. With an app, when somebody's like, well, how much would it cost me to add this feature? In your head, you're not like, I could go to the store and kind of compare it. It's just like, they're gonna, they're gonna say some number and it's probably not even accurate. You know, so you, the hard part is you can't compare costs. With Builder AI, what's cool is I'm like, well, how much would it cost to add this feature? They can say, here's your shopping list, that's it. It's 2,000 bucks. Yeah, the coolest thing for us is we said, what if it was also an iPhone app and not just a website, and it was like a click or two? Yeah, they're like $20,000 or right. whatever. You know what I mean? Like They know exactly how to, oh, you want to do Android? Exactly. <laughs> OK, great. Um, so taking, taking the devil's advocate side of this, so do you think anything could have been better if you had a more rigid build plan um, that didn't evolve or change during your app development process? Yeah, I think like, I think people underestimate the intricacies of apps. Like think about like, you're like, oh, I want this game app. And you're thinking of it as like a user's perspective, but then you're like, there's an admin console. There's a backend management that's changing colors and picking characters and designing this and that and this. You're like, I know what the end user f is like, but you don't know the, how do you do payment? And how do you track customers? And how do you build permissions? And you have to think through all of those things. And so as you like go build out your first thing, having a little bit more of the, like from the top down, not just from the bottom up approach, could have helped us speed up or even thought about the front end side a little bit more, um, just faster, because right now we're like bottlenecked on the back end, because we're like, oh shoot, there's three times more screens that we need on the back end than we did on the front end. It, it's kind of like that fantasy that a lot of people have had. How many people here have had a fantasy about opening up a restaurant, right? And what it would be like to run a restaurant? That's like a really popular fantasy people have. But you never think about all that it takes to run the restaurant until you talk to somebody who actually has run the restaurant, and all the back of the house challenges that it takes to actually keep things supplied and cleaned and avoiding Gordon Ramsay coming in and yelling at you at random and things like that. But the chef specials, like when you go into a restaurant that's run really well, the menu is kind of small, everything is done with quite good attention, and then the specials menu allows you to offer that kind of flexibility on a day-to-day -day basis. That's kind of like this. It's like the opposite of the kind of restaurant that everything's frozen and very rigid, right? And you allow people to be able to be malleable, change their mind, and make these kinds of improvements and offer some special flair. If a business decides it wants to take a different angle, business decides it wants to get rid of something because it's not working out, it doesn't have to be a complete crisis every time. Because sometimes you pull back on a feature too. Yeah, and here's one, one thing. Like anybody in the audience that's like looking to start a business or add a technology to their tools, uh, my two cents is like, just start. What a lot of people do is they, they, they think that it's so much harder than it really is. This is probably the seventh app that I've built. Three of them probably nobody even knows about. And you know, just by like taking that imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. And I look at a lot of people that try to get into business or, or they're, they're trying to do things. It's okay to like play around tinker and have a little bit of budget knowing that it might not be the end all say all feature set because you might start down a path and then get so much feedback and just realize, man, I'm more passionate, this is more profitable than what my original idea was. Wow, we're winning way over here and was least expecting that. But if you would have never started down a path at all and never would have been taken the you know, small investment to just start going and doing something, you would have never ever started on your journey of an entrepreneur or journey down the path of actually creating something. And all of a sudden you look up a year later and you're like, wow, we got something actually kind of cool. This is, this is rad. Like it's that, that was really beautiful. Can you pick handsome or wise, like one or the other, please? <laughs> that would be really nice if you could just stick to one or the other. So are you suggesting that people should start uh, building their applications as soon as they have an idea flushed out over building out a full project plan? No, yeah, just start. Like, it, Get the login page. If you guys, I wish I could pull up my vibe on here. Like I have a digital whiteboard. And <laughs> my guys were just like, yes, we should show that. It's me at midnight drawing stuff on a whiteboard and taking pictures and being like, hey guys, can you 
draw me up something like this, and then a designer would make it look cool. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I like that. And then I go back to the whiteboard, and like, it was just like me sending stuff off to good designer looking people, where it's just, I don't know how to make it look pretty, I just know I want it to do this thing, and then I start testing it with audience. Yeah, I think that's really important to be able to experiment and iterate. You know, user experience is that other part of it, right? So you have people for that. Um, your your team was willing to work. Look, we have a big creative inter internal part of our team, like we talked about, right? So for some of the things, we wanted design to be completely on builder. Some of the things, and most of them, we wanted them to be completely on our design people and to have you focus on dev, and you offered us the ability to do both. If we want a rapid prototype on visuals, we can do that all day. And if we want a rapid prototype on app functionality, we can do that all day now, too. So that, that would have been really helpful to have when we were ideating the business in the first place. Um, we might have hit the gas pedal on a couple of efforts sooner, for sure. But now we do all the time because of you. So it's just the best of both worlds for you guys. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, great. So I wanna switch gears just a little bit. Um, so Sam, you're a self-funded entrepreneur, and Coin, you're at a very well-funded, um, hyper-growth real estate company. I'm wondering how the different setups um, you know, impact the decisions that you make, um, especially when it comes to planning and building technology spend and your application designs. Well, I, I think for us, um, one of the big challenges is that any time that you're starting a real estate brokerage, even though we happen to be much more than that because we have these different pillars, uh, whenever you're starting a brokerage from scratch, you start to look at the landscape and what it looks like and how you're gonna differentiate yourselves, right? And we can call ourselves a technology-focused real estate company, but of course there are a couple of those that already exist, one of them in particular, has a budget that they spend, I think, $300 million a year. They have 700 internal developers, uh, and they're, they're known for being very tech-focused and spending money like it's going out of style. Now, I didn't have that option getting started. We have to be very strategic, we have to be very intelligent. We need to build up from nothing. Now, of course, my boss had a fantastically successful and publicly-facing career um, that definitely got us started and had a ton of brand recognition coming into the market as a brand new company. A fantastic thing to have at your back, but it isn't the only thing. We needed to think, we're not trying to copy or outspend the competition. How do we outsmart them by taking a radically different approach? So, when I was looking into different ways and different partners to help us as we were scaling our internal and external relationships, and I'm reading Gartner, and it says, this company, Builder AI, was rated by Gartner as taking a radically different approach. I said, holy crap, where are they watching me? Where are the cameras? I needed exactly this kind of thing. So for us, it's been very heavily leveraged strategic partnerships that have allowed us to be a startup in a corporation's clothing in some ways, right? We turned two on September 15th of 2022, just a, what a week and a half ago. Um, and for us, we look like a lot more than just a two-year-old company because of having made the investments, the deep investments into having fantastic vendor partner relationships like with Builder uh, to accelerate that growth and to seem like a tech destination uh, because we are, because of those decisions. Ridley, your answer, by the way. I Thanks, bro. Guys, give it up for Coin. He's the man. <laughs> like that. <laughs> he, uh, so I unfortunately did not have millions of dollars just chilling to throw at this. And Neither did I. It, so it, like, but what's, cra what's crazy is like, I'm like the dude that was shopping at like Salvation Army growing up, you know what I mean? Like I was like the fr like frugal, stingy kind of guy. And when you're self-funding, like I look at the tech companies here and I'm like, good for them. They go to VC, they get a bunch of money and then they go blow a ton on debt. They go to another VC and they get more money and they blow a ton and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm in business to make money. Raise your hand if you're in business to make money. Like that's the point of a business, Both right? hands, both hands, yeah, everybody. And, and both I hands. look at, I'm like, I wonder how many of these businesses have a profitable balance sheet. And I was like, I'm not doing that game. Like why would I go give away my company to some VC to then never make money because I'm in an endless money pit of spending on debt. And I was like, I want to be a sales company. I want to have a product and then go sell it. And so. I took this approach, like a different approach, where I was like, I know my fixed costs, I know my return on money, I know, like I, I could already forecast out where this was gonna make sense on my money. And so it's a much more confident approach, where the first two I was like, that was an endless money pit that I never really saw a return, because it was like a year and a half with no new features and just spending money. 
and it was hard to sell until I got the new features. So I'm in a stalemate. I don't want to sell it until I have the thing, but I'm spending the money now, right? Chicken and the egg. It's the chicken and the egg, right? Because you don't want to deliver a crappy product because then you get a bad name and then you don't feel confident what you're selling. And so this approach I took with the Builder AI, I really enjoyed because I'm sitting here as a chief business owner that doesn't want to go drop thou like, I mean, I dropped a lot of money, but in, in relative, <laughs> no, but, it, but relatively speaking, um, for what we got, it is significantly, like I'm talking, this is probably hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars cheaper doing it the way that we did it. And I feel like I'm a much better steward to my business and the people that work in it and my team because I'm being responsible with the spend. And it doesn't feel open-ended, no, right? No, it's not like an open It I'm doesn't like feel like you just have to hope and pray all the time. Like, no. I, I used to lose sleep. I used to have hair. And I you can't go I, strangle I, them back in India. You know what I mean? You're not like, I'll get those developers. You're like, I don't know where they're at. Like, in the Ukrainians, I was like, my boys, how you doing in this like, war? Hey, CIA, like, I literally can I borrow the satellite for a second? I got to find somebody? Like, yeah, that was yeah. that kind of I literally call him. I'm like, hey, you guys doing okay? Is this war's going on in Ukraine? And I'm like over here like, um, but I still need these bugs fixed. Like, I don't want to be that dick, but like, you know what I mean? He was just like, you're, you're good. Like, I'm like, you guys like take your time, but like I still got customers canceling now, so. It's like, I know about the bombs, but we need our app to also be the bomb. Yeah, Can we yeah. like close the gap on those? True two story people? though. You know what I mean? That, that, that's like what's interesting is when you're running a business, like you're looking at dollars and cents too, and you just hate wasting money. I hate wasting money. You know who hates wasting money more than you? My boss. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, so look, there's gonna be people in the audience who want to move in a more agile manner, right? They want to be able to move faster and not have to plan every little thing out um, before they kick off initiatives. What advice do you have for them? Like where should they start with these things? Get a digital whiteboard. No, I'm serious. Like, I think that the one's ability to just start drawing it. Like, I think that a lot of people think they need to be a designer, that they need to be this great business owner. Like, all of a sudden you start drawing stuff on a whiteboard and then running it by smart people and saying, what do you think? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? Most people can understand your concept when you draw it on a whiteboard. They're like, oh yeah, they can visualize if this looked cool and did what you were saying on the whiteboard, I'd buy that or I'd use that or the market does need that. And I think that's your first start is like, Build your app on a damn whiteboard and then start, you know what I mean? And then start doing stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't think that there are necessarily always, uh, okay, I don't want to generalize here, okay? I don't always hear an app idea that's amazing. There's a blend. Some ideas that I hear are good. Some ideas that I hear are bad. But you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? The great one, Gretzky, of course, uh, started that whole thing. Um, to me, I think the reason a lot of apps don't happen is they're not talking to the right people, right? I've heard people say, yeah, I got a quote for that once and I didn't do it because it was like astronomical or I didn't have enough confidence or my business plan, you know, I couldn't get investors to be confident in something because I didn't have, you know, the, the backing security and certainty that the way I was gonna go about it, the person who I was gonna use didn't have the credibility in their mind and they didn't think it was a safe bet. So a lot of things don't even get off the ground when sometimes it's all about making sure that you've got that other approach, you know? Take the big risk. If you have big ideas, why are you keeping it to yourself? You, I've heard, talked to a lot of people that say, yeah, I've been thinking about this thing for years, I just never did anything about it. Well, maybe you're talking to the wrong people and should be speaking to somebody who can make it easier for you, yeah. And it might also show up as a pattern in your life. How many times do you want something but you never take action and go do it? I find that so many people they're never where they want to be because they're always the talkers, they're not the doers. Hence why I have built six different tech platforms. It doesn't mean they're all killing it. You know what I mean? I don't have an Uber out on the app, app store, right? But the other part and approach that might be interesting is go white label a different software for a minute that's maybe kind of like what you're looking to build and see if you can't go get some traction and some revenue built. Um, it's kind of an unconventional circle around and be like, maybe I can like, Google Sheet the app for a minute, or maybe I could like ghetto put it together and get a few customers on my service or my idea to start generating some revenue to then pay for it. But you know, that's if you're like, that's one other approach. But I'm just saying, I think the reality is, is ask 
hey, do I also want to lose 20 pounds? Are you the type that always says, I want to lose 20 pounds and never loses the 20 pounds? Or are you the type that's like, I want to lose 20 pounds, you go lose the 20 pounds? It's really close to home, bro, really close to home. <laughs> Just like chill a little we bit. We love you, we love you. I love you too. Uh, no, but you see what I'm saying though? Like, it's what kind of action taker or, or risk taker are you willing to be and where are you willing to put your money behind your mouth? Amazing. All right. And so I have one last question before we throw it out to the audience to ask you guys some questions. Um, and that's uh, where you think the role of the CIO and the CTO is going and how it's changed during your careers. And I think this is a, a great question to ask the two of you because you have such potentially different perspectives. Coin, you being a CTO and um, and you totally, uh, you know, not wanting to engage with the technology any more than you have to, Sam. So. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear your perspective, so I'd actually like to hear Sam's first. Well, fine then. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a CTO. No, the reality is I'm like, wait, Builder, can you be our CTO? The reason being, I'll, I, I don't need to know how to code. I don't want to know how to freaking look at the line items. I just want to trust that the code's going to do what it's going to do. I need product guy, meaning the product guy is the innovator. He's the one that's like hearing from the sales team, hearing from the customer, and hearing from customer success saying, what's all working and not working and what's gonna be market fit? That product guy that needs to know how to communicate to the coder team, which you guys have like a, we call it like our liaison, Alex or whatever, and he's then talking to all the tech nerds that sit there behind the computer, right? So, you know what I'm saying though? <laughs> ben luckily, like when we worked on that project, like. He luckily saw it from a sales world, but then was able to be the coder. But nine times out of 10, the coders are like zeros and ones and zeros and ones or whatever they're doing. They can't think like, what is a customer buying? So for me, I'd rather have a product guy or whatever you want to call that position that then runs the low code or no, you know, kind of people to then design. He's more of a designer, visionary product type creator. Awesome. And Coin, your rebuttal? So I'm the guy that works harder than that. Just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, for me, you know, it's interesting when I hear that because that's one of the roles. Like when you describe the product guy, like I'm that for us for most of our projects as part of the larger suite of roles, right? If like, if I was Microsoft, I am all the Word and Excel and PowerPoint and Outlook, like I'm, I'm the suite of tools because we had no choice for a long time, right? Just like you or any, o any other small business, you don't start out with the head count that you wish you had. You're the bookkeeper, you're the janitor, you do all the different things yourself for as long as you have to, right? And there are some people who are so micromanaging they never let go, and they like it that way. I think I heard, was it the CEO of G2 today? He said he missed doing his own bookkeeping and accounting and QuickBooks, um, which I spoke to him about after, and I was like, dude, really though? Like, anyway, but yeah, for me, I, I was confronted recently, like forget everything else I was gonna say. I sat down recently across from somebody who was talking to me and asking me questions about our business. And he said, uh, so what, what programming languages do you know? What do you code in? And I said, no, none, like a little HTML that I learned back when I was like making my MySpace page, like rain copyright <laughs> symbols or whatever. Um, but none, why? And he's like, oh, because I'm used to meeting CTOs that are like also a programmer or also a developer and are very involved in the creation of products that are being built. And I'm like, but I can hire thousands of those people. I'm one of the 10 super nerds on the planet who can hold a microphone and not be nervous. Why would that be important? You know, I, I look up how to be a better CTO and the results are learn how to manage people and communicate better. And I'm like, okay, so I'll go backwards because that's something that I already feel very comfortable with. So for me, using that to become the biz ops guy, you hear DevOps, you hear RevOps, you hear all different, you know, dev lead and different kinds of code positions within the company. You know, yeah, I manage an IT department that's like 10% of my job. The rest of it is making sure that we're going in a good direction. We're not wasting money, we're not wasting time. And I'm making sure to listen to all the departments and translate everybody's needs or their problems into something that becomes the direction and the orientation of the company's technology existence. You can't do that unless you're able to translate well, you're able to listen well, and if I can sit in the room with my leadership team and make it sound like plain English for them. So that I think is the most important thing for CTOs and, and people adjacent to that in 2022 and beyond is, how's your universal translator working and do you need to improve that? 
is being that bridge between humans and super nerds. Uh, that is really, really super essential. It's also part of trust. It's one of the reasons those old development styles for apps don't work out. It's because that product person isn't available. You get the update email, you can't decode the thing, you know? Um, so thank you for helping also make my life easier because I can go away for a day or two and you can actually talk to the rest of my team, which is great. I love that, and that job description pretty much writes itself, right? I mean, like, I practiced it in front of the mirror a few times. I hope it didn't feel rushed, you know? <laughs> but yeah. well, I also would add, like, what if you kind of decentralize that hierarchy a little bit instead of just having a CTO and hierarchical, what if you created more of a committee? And this committee, and, and when we're on our development call, which is twice a week, we have our designer on there, we have our marketer guy on there, we have me on there, and we have our customer success guy on there, and collectively, we're all piping in. And I found that like almost this committee, every and being very involved in the product development has been really insightful because the customer success guy is gonna chip in something and be like, well, basically we need, and I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Like it's gotta do that. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah, us too. But that's, that's a very important point. Thank you for adding yeah. that, for sure. I thought that was just a cool little plug. No, for sure, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, we wanted to open it up to the audience if anybody's got any questions that they uh, want Sam and Coin to answer for you. The amazing Sam and Coin will answer anything. We're about Please. to coin this. That's right. It's trending. You look like you have a question. I feel like you want to ask something, but I don't want to go first is going through your head. The question was, how does the scalability of Builder work? What is the scalability potential and how does the platform function in that regard? Shalab, you wanna take that one? Yeah, um, so uh, you know, really that's about hosting. Um, you know, we put all of our apps um, either on Azure or on AWS. Um, and you know, we started uh, life as a, as a cloud company, so we we're basically reselling cloud before we got into building applications for people. So we've got a really great automation platform that does predictive analysis on your cloud utilization and automatically extends out everything that you need in the underlying infrastructure and then scales it back. So you're never paying for more than you need, plus we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on cloud consumption. And so you, as a customer, get the benefit of discounts based on those volumes. We also end up signing really long-term contracts because we're confident that we'll be able to sell that, right? So uh, most people aren't willing to do that when they're building an app because they don't know how long they're going to need that, uh, you know, need that horsepower. So it's like Costco for cloud storage, you guys. It's great. Love that analogy. Anybody else? Right there, sir. So his question was, what do you do as like a non-techie person, which I'm a sales guy by trade, to empathize and communicate with the developers? And at first it was really hard, because like I'd be like, I need this done, and by next week, and then you're like, you suck, and they're like, that's an impossible ask. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it's only adding like a new thing that says a search bar. And I'm like, it doesn't take you five days to add a search bar. It's just this, the yeah, J like, word, just. just. This. It's just this, dude, just add the search bar. And then they're like, well, that's gonna, I'm like, what, really? And it was really hard for me to understand like their timeline or their this, right? And so it took years, like it really did. It took me understanding their language and not just Ruby on Rails or C++, it was understanding how they needed to be communicated to and then giving them the time to do the thing. Because as sales guys, you're trying to sell them on coding more. Like just code faster and code more and do it like this. But you, it was about like understanding, okay, realistically, can we come to an agreement to where we can have this, what, what can we have done by Friday of my whole priority list? Because you just need to set expectations. Yeah. That's what it's all about, right? Is you need to really feel confident in those expectations so you can set them outward on the sales side. Yeah, and just, and then also like, making them feel part of the team. Like like I was offering to fly them all, if they could have got work visas, I was like, hey, come out to freaking Utah for door to door con. Like, hey, make it like, involve them. Like I was checking in when the Ukrainian tag thing was going on and stuff like that. So like having this like element of 
I know they're the nerds, and I don't speak their language. You know, they're like, we hate sales guys. You know what I mean? That tends to be their like mantra. Like, be like, look, I'm on your team, you're on my team. Like, we're trying to make this a win-win, and making sure that they're involved in the vision and the long term, and then also giving them feedback. Like, hey, we just landed a big customer, and they're like, sweet. A lot of times they don't see revenue, they don't see customer wins, they don't see, oh, we love this. So telling them that, be like, dude, because you changed this, we've gotten so many people that are loving this, all of a sudden they get that dopamine hit and they're like, oh cool, my thing worked. You know what I mean? Those are fun little techniques. Yeah, we, we've had, I had one uh, micro experience with that where one of our designers said to me, they're like, my dream is just to be able to design something that I can put in every everybody's hands. I want to design something that's in every home in America, you know? And I said, well, that's kind of what we're doing. Right? If we're going to make this brand and, and our reach so wide, you design something that will help all these people. It'll be in their hands. You know, you can achieve your goals, your long-term goals here. Sometimes you just need to squint and tilt your head to realize that it's kind of aligned. You know, so sometimes it's even translating that in those ways that can actually become rewarding and align with what their long-term goals are. Yeah, I think that's really relevant. And I, just to go back to what Sam was saying, it's one of the reasons that we do put that product person in the middle for you guys, and you don't talk directly to developers. Yeah, with Builder, I like I don't even know where the developers are, because like Shalab's in a different country every week, and he's over here just like, yeah, I was just chilling in Austria, and I was like, you have a team there, and he's like, yeah, and I like drinking talk, amazing I, wine the whole I, time. <laughs> I talked to the lady from London the other day, and I was like, well, you're in London, what do you do in London? Oh, well, I'm at our London office. I was like, oh. So I've never talked to one of their developers. I don't know. They could all be robots for all I know. Cause suppose Juan's pretty cool. Yeah, because they're all AI. So I was like, are they even developers? <laughs> like, <laughs> It's still a mystery to me. I just talked to the product guy, and then he talks to the developers and the team, and that's all I know. Anybody right. else? I could, we can kind of see right there. Uh, this is for builder.ai. Do you have an app marketplace where people, developers, anyone could go and potentially use whatever kind of back-end API or something like that to help help build apps and, and things on onto what you guys are doing. He wants to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay, so uh, yeah, we do have actually uh, two different sides to our business. Uh, so one is uh, the side that Sam and Coin are using, which is the custom apps. We can basically build anything you want. Um, on the other side of it is the prefabricated apps that we have, and primarily those are right now for um, like small to medium-sized businesses that need that have a specific need. Like I'm a restaurant, I want to be able to take reservations, I want to be able to do delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, that marketplace could absolutely be used for anything. And the other thing that we're doing with that is that we can take services that are out there. Um, like payment gateways and things like that and aggregating all the usage so that if you want to partner with us, like if you have a service that you want to be able to sell to other applications, um, we can put that in our marketplace and every time we stamp out um, a new application that's going to use it, right, we can do some kind of a partnership and a rev share model that works for everyone. Anybody else? I think we can see past the lights. Anybody over there in the polka dots? Oh my God. <laughs> I can see. You should never sit down and then stand up. So um, that's how you get in trouble. Uh, my question is for Coin. Sweet uh, pants, by the way. They're cool, aren't they? <laughs> anyway, um, they've got lots of love, and we've heard about love today, so there you go. Um, Coin, markets are changing. How is oh, your the strategy? Big question. The big yeah. question. Okay. And, uh, you know, I had it. Um, with the markets changing, what are you doing as CTO to change? applications underneath your strategies and does that have any impact on what you're doing with builder so there's a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy for every business right you have the goals that you need to achieve either this quarter or over the next couple of quarters and you have you have where you see yourself in five years or longer uh, we're no different you know our long-term plans are not changing because we understand that real estate is cyclical Market factors sometimes are under our control, sometimes they're, they're not in our control. Um, the way that we respond to it is that maybe we'll turbocharge the people that we have internally and what their, their access to additional uh, thought leadership, potentially. Um, like we have weekly meetings that we have where the agents can collaborate on what their questions are and curiosities are. Uh, from Ryan, from other people, our, our director of new dev, Jennifer Elise, is just otherworldly when it comes to new dev. 
I think we've signed 32 new development buildings just in 2022, which is astonishing. Um, we, we definitely don't, we're not flappable when it comes to short-term changes in the market. I don't really remember a time that real estate was ever affected for much longer than four to six months before it started to have uh, different kinds of rebound effects. Uh, something that Ryan, is that, sorry, some, something that Ryan talked about uh, recently was that, you know, we will weather. It's is not 2008. Uh, we're going to keep con empowering our agents with the apps that we're developing and have developed and put the best tools in their hands and hope for the best. All right. I think we're out of time. It is the end of the day. We're not it standing the in anybody's end of the way. Day. So if you have more questions, we can technically keep going. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, big round of applause for Sam Taggart and Coin. Really, really appreciate you guys coming out and speaking here. Thank you, guys.